Jesus' name, amen. So raise your hand if you've ever set a goal, tried to start a habit, tried to stop a habit, and it didn't take. Everybody. Okay. Uh, I'm definitely with you on that. Uh, we might chalk those failed attempts up to a lack of initiative, lack of motivation, lack of willpower, uh, maybe blaming other people or circumstances. Maybe the thought that I'm just not wired that way. I'm, I just don't have what it takes. But let me suggest that it may not be for any of those reasons. The, the main reason most of us struggle with establishing habits is not because we lack in those areas or, or because of something that's beyond us. Most of us struggle with establishing habits because we try to change in the wrong ways. Uh, most of us think if I have goals plus willpower, I should be a success at this. So why isn't it working? Well, it's not working because there's more to it. That, that's not the way it works. The good news is that we can learn the way it does work. Here's the basic premise is written by James Clear. Uh, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. We don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. James Clear wrote that. And just for definition, goals are our desired results. Systems are the processes that lead to those results. We've got lots of practical note slides for you tonight. So if you want to have something to write on or get your camera out for taking pictures of the, the slides, I encourage you to do that so you can look back on those later. Uh, contrary to what most of us learned growing up, trying harder just isn't a very effective system in general, especially in areas where we've built a highway going in the wrong direction with our neural pathways or, or when spiritual warfare may be at work. So tonight we're going to learn how to put the right systems in place so we can develop the right habits. Uh, if you'd like to take a deeper look into the ideas from tonight's message, I can recommend a few really good books and, uh, on habits and spiritual warfare. One's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Another's The Power to Change by Craig Rochelle. And uh, a lot of this message comes from that book, but there's, it, it goes into it a lot deeper. And third is The Path Toward Passion by Dean Troon, who used to be a campus minister at Michigan State. Uh, a lot of tonight's message does come from that middle one, power to change. So tonight, we're going to look at five systems for making changes that last. And we've got a lot of info tonight, but it's really practical. Five systems for making changes that last. Number one, focus on who rather than do. Focus on who rather than do. When wanting to start a new habit, the default thought tends to be focusing on the task. What task do I need to be doing? The, the do part. Um, but we're going to start with the why, and the why is going to lead us to this who in, in the, the, the heading. So you do what you do because of what you think of you. It's a nice little rhyme. You do what you do because of what you think of you. For example, if you say, I'm just not good with names, uh, then you're already linking your identity whether or not you're going to attempt to learn somebody's name. Or you know, if you keep saying, I'm just not a morning person, you're not going to establish a discipline of morning God times. Craig Rochelle is the senior pastor of Life.Church, which is the church that designed the YouVersion Bible app, which many of you use. Uh, he started a habit of flossing every morning to develop the idea that he was a disciplined person. He actually hated flossing, but he told himself, I'm a disciplined, disciplined person, and every time I floss, I'm casting a vote in that direction, that, that, uh, in support of that who. And establishing that one habit has impacted so many areas of his life because he, he adds one major habit every year and, and just keeps building on that. It's impacted so many areas of his life. Um, the ultimate goal for, for Craig wasn't to floss. The goal was to be disciplined. So you see how that works? You do what you do because of what you think of you. So to change what you do, change what you think of you. 
to change what you do, change what you think of you. <clears throat> this brings us to the why of spiritual disciplines in general. Uh, and the why leads us right into the, the who. If our why behind spiritual discipline, be, between, behind spiritual habits is task-driven, those disciplines won't get us very far, or, or they won't be very effective. Should, it's never a great motivator. Or if our why stems out of pride, or at the other end, if, if our why stems out of struggles with unworthiness, those aren't going to help us either. Those don't lead to the who that we want to identify with. <clears throat> Let me propose a why for spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines help me become closer to and more like Jesus. Spiritual disciplines help me become closer to and more like Jesus. And again, spiritual disciplines help me become closer to and more like Jesus. I want you to really grasp that thought. This is our why. If this is your why behind starting good habits and stopping bad ones, the Holy Spirit can transform your life through this. But becoming closer to and more like Jesus, if that's not your why, um, becoming closer with Jesus, you can learn these practical skills for starting skills for starting and stopping habits. And honestly, that's nice, but that's not going to tr transform your life. Spiritual disciplines help me become closer to and more like Jesus. So that is our why, and that's also our who behind spiritual disciplines. <clears throat> We're going to look up a passage, 2 Corinthians 3.18. I'm just going to go through these quickly tonight so they'll be on the screen. And we all are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Christians are being transformed. Jesus is actively trying to transform us back to his image. And spiritual disciplines help move that along because we're working with Jesus in that instead of working against him in that process. So the who and the why is Jesus. And, he, and the who he wants us to be which, which is more like him. So focus on who rather than do. The next system that helps us make changes that last is to train rather than try. Number two, train rather than try. And this system motivates us with the importance of our habits to get us to that who that we want to be. You don't try to run a marathon. You don't try to bench press 300 pounds. That would be stupid on both accounts. You would train for those things. Uh, and just for clarity, training is attempted effort in the moment, or trying is attempted effort in the moment, and training are strategic habits done before the moment that equip you for the moment. So trying is attempted effort in the moment, training is strategic habits done before the moment that equip you for the moment. So scripture memorization is a perfect example of this. If we've memorized appropriate scripture, then when we're confronted with lies or, or temptations, we'll be equipped in the moment uh, to take those thoughts captive and to refute them with God's word. That is a great motivator. 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 10, says, Train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Uh, it, it links, this training links back to the who. With the training not trying approach, Instead of a nebulous someday result, uh, you can make doing your habit the win. Instead of waiting till you reach a certain point, doing the habit is the win. Make doing your habit the win. I'm not going to uh, pray. I, I want to be a prayer warrior. I I'm not just going to pray. I want to be a prayer warrior because that lines me up with Jesus and draws me closer to him. So every time I pray, that's a win. I am training for that future self. I'm casting a vote toward the type of person that I want to be. 
I have a friend who's training for the NFL. Uh, some of you remember him. He was a student here, part of his house um, pre-COVID. Uh, he's made the preseason squad or practice squad for the Ravens, the Browns, and the Packers, but he still hasn't secured a spot on the regular season team. So he is always training and, and, and trying to improve himself. And when he makes the team someday, hits that milestone, do you think he'll be like, all right, I'm done training, I, I made it. Now he's going to continue to train for that future person that he wants to be. Uh, do we always feel like practicing our disciplines? Of course not. Uh, discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. Discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. This can be a great motivator in helping us stop bad habits, strongholds, addictions, as well as establishing new habits, good habits. Discipline is choosing what you want now, what you want most over what you want now. So keep training towards your future self. And in, in the meantime, make the daily habit your win. So train rather than try. The third system is to step rather than hope. Step rather than hope. Uh, we can hope all we want for a change in our lives. Man, I hope to be someone who really knows God's word. I, I hope to be someone who's genuine, uh, generous. I, I hope to someday play a new instrument. I hope to be physically fit someday. But to be honest, until we start establishing the right habit, it's not going to happen. This system gives us some practical steps to take toward that new healthy habit. So this helps us get our training off the ground. So within this third system, there are five steps to establish a new habit. So step rather than hope, here are our steps. A, make it obvious. Five steps to establish a new habit. A, make it obvious. Every habit, good or bad, is triggered by a signal or a cue. To break bad habits, it's helpful to eliminate the cues. Uh, for example, I know some guys who've, who've switched to a flip phone from their smartphone to remove, remove the cues that might lead them toward old lustful habits. Or, or if you... If sin, whatever it is, tends to find you at 1 a.m., go to bed at midnight and remove those cues. If I'm trying to establish a new <clears throat> good habit, uh, <clears throat> I want to make the cue as obvious as possible. Excuse me. <clears throat> we tend to do not what's best, but what's most obvious. So to change what you do, you need to change what you see. To change what you do, you need to change what you see. A small change in what you see can lead to a big shift in what you do. If you're wanting to develop the spiritual discipline of fasting, you might post a post-it note on your refrigerator door or the snack cupboard that reminds you of your fast. So before the mindless habit of walking to the fridge sabotages your plan. Uh, if you're trying to build a daily habit of starting your day with God's word, you might set your Bible next to your toothbrush or, or the coffee pot the night, the night before. That's a strategy called habit stacking. Habit stacking. Uh, you link the new habit you're trying to establish with one that you already do. Besides just setting your cue there, you can verbalize it by saying, after I current habit, I will new habit. After I current habit, I will new habit. Such as, after I make my coffee, I will read my Bible. Uh, sometimes it's easier to build new habits in a new environment so we're not fighting against old cues. So you might say, I'm going to have my God time in this specific chair or in, in this room or at this park or at this hidden spot on campus like the lotus room or the reading room in the library and then going to that location is your cue to initiate the habit you can also make it obvious by preloading your decisions decide before what you will do later 
Decide before what you will do later. Uh, don't leave it, up, leave it up to how you're feeling in the moment. Not, it's not, if I feel like it, I'll have God time tomorrow. It's, I'll have my God time tomorrow with my favorite morning beverage sitting by the windowsill, for example. Uh, that flows right into the next step. B, make it attractive. Make it attractive by linking your, your God time to your coffee or your favorite chair or a place overlooking God's creation. You're making your new habit attractive to do. Maybe you'll want a favorite notebook or a set of colored pens. Maybe you'll want worship music playing, or maybe you don't. Maybe you'd rather have ambient nature sounds with no words. Uh, maybe you want to light a scented candle. Uh, whatever could make our new habit more attractive to practice, it's okay and helpful to link those together. The third step is to C, make it easy. Make it easy. Most of us, by default, tend to take the path of least resi resistance. We don't need a big, magical first step. We just need to start. So a habit must be established before it can be improved. A habit must be established before it can be improved. So start small. Pick a version of your new habit that takes less than two minutes to do. Let's make it super easy. Pick a version of your new habit that takes less than two minutes to do. For example, I'm going to pray for at least two minutes. Uh, if you pray for longer than that, great. But the point is not to make an insurmountable initial goal that will effectively keep us from starting. Once you start doing the right thing, it's much easier to continue doing the right thing. But if you make your habit hard to start you probably won't. Or you'll start, but then be tempted to quit right away. The point is not to do, just to do that one thing. Uh, the point is to show up and start. So better to do less than you were hoping than doing nothing at all. Better to do less than you were hoping than doing nothing at all. For example, um, someone trying to do their quiet time, their God time, they're like, oh, I'm kind of rushed, I'm kind of distracted, and so I'm not going to do it. Or hit the play on your audio Bible, and you're listening to it as you're getting ready, and then you've got some, maybe it's not 100% of what you like, but it's still better than not having it at all. A, a super huge application is our God time with this. That, that small start could take you somewhere really big, and, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, the fourth step, D, make it communal. Make it communal. One of my most consistent uh, seasons of exercise is when our executive director, Scott Austin, uh, FaceTimes me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning at 7.30 a.m. to do our push-ups together. And that might sound really awkward or, or silly um, to do push-ups with someone over FaceTime, but I did my push-ups usually more than three times a week that entire semester. So write down your habit goal and tell someone. Write down your habit goal and tell someone. Ask them for accountability, uh, or better yet, invite them to participate. And the fifth step to establish a new habit, E, make it repetitious. Make it repetitious. Many of us have heard that it takes 21 days or 40 days or 90 days to establish a new habit. But it's not actually about the number of days, but the number of repetitions. What matters is how many times I do the new behavior. Uh, the more often I do it, the more, uh, the more it will be hardwired into my brain, which will make the behavior easier to keep doing. The more you do something, the easier it is to do. <laughs> that, that's true of, of sin. The more we do it, it's easier to get pulled into it. But the more we establish good habits, the easier it is to uh, stay in those and, and keep doing them. Here's a little axiom about this called Hebb's Rule, which states, neurons that fire together wire together. Neurons that fire together wire together. 
So a, a great strategy James Clear gives for getting uh, your new habit uh, established is never miss twice. Like um, when your schedule is thrown off, such as going home for spring break, and you forget to do your habit, it's okay. It happens. Just when you realize, oh, I forgot to do my habit, be sure to get back on track immediately. This will ensure you keep it moving forward. What you do occasionally does not make a difference, but what you do consistently makes all the difference. I don't have a slide for that, but I'll say it again. What you do occasionally doesn't make a difference, but what you do consistently makes all the difference. So now, back to the systems we're trying to establish. Uh, that was step rather than hope, and we went through those five steps. The next system is to farm rather than fish, and fish with the pH. Number four, farm rather than fish. So fishing with the pH is an illegitimate form of business. Uh, it's about shortcuts and deception and theft. People who fish are pretending to be someone they're not or to represent a business that they don't. They're expecting different results than the actions they're investing in. So instead of that mindset, uh, let's learn some lessons from farming. Let's look at Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So this passage doesn't use the words habits or disciplines, but that's exactly what it's talking about. Um, let's make a few observations from this farming illustration. So three observations about planting and harvesting. Three observations about planting and harvesting. One, we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. I planted popcorn in our garden at, at our house last year. And I had a jar of Amish multicolored popcorn just for popping and eating. And I planted enough of those seeds for one row of popcorn, one small row in our garden. Um, so what did I end up harvesting from that? Popcorn, right? I, I can't be mad at my garden for not producing sweet corn or wheat or okra because I didn't plant any of those seeds. The same is true with our habits. So if you don't like what you're reaping, change what you're sowing. So habits that will lead you toward the who that you want to be. A second observation is we reap more than we sow. We reap more than we sow. I planted about 30 seeds of that Amish popcorn, so it wasn't genetically engineered to produce multiple huge ears on each stalk. But from those 30 seeds, I reaped well over 100-fold. Uh, there's a photo um, of our popcorn yield, a quart jar, and a pint jar, so about 48 ounces all together, all that from 30 seeds. Uh, we also reap more than we sow in our habits. A, a small difference each day adds up and multiplies over time. Even if I'm starting with that little two-minute habit, the effect over time will multiply. The effects of consistent habits accumulate and compound over time, so a small change can change everything. The effects of consistent habits accumulate and compound over time, compound like interest. So a small change can change everything. One more observation about farming. We reap after we sow. We reap after we sow. For harvesting popcorn, you want to wait until the husk around the ears uh, turns all brown and, and dry along with the corn stalk. Uh, I planted the popcorn back in mid-May. I harvested it shortly after fall retreat, so it was mid to late October, five months after I planted it. When we start spiritual disciplines, it will take time to see some of the benefits. But if we've planted the right seeds and been consistent in that habit, we will see the results. It won't be because we had hopes and goals about them, 
but because of the habits that we formed toward them. We will reap a harvest in due season if we do not give up. Hebrews 12.11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So again, discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. Farm rather than fish. We don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. Our, our last system to support our new habits is number five, rely rather than will. Rely rather than will. I'm not just going to will results into existence because of my awesome willpower. Uh, we're going to rely on God's power to keep us going when it's hard. Sometimes our habits are hard to keep implementing. Results take longer than we expect. Uh, we may feel exhausted or not in the mood. We might be distracted. We might start to feel disillusioned about our habits and feel like quitting. Then this little voice might rise up cheering you on. You got this. You can do this. It's all you. Don't listen to that voice. What? Why wouldn't we listen to that? That voice is coming from our flesh or from the enemy telling us to rely on our willpower instead of God's power. But willpower doesn't work, not consistently over the long haul. It's like a muscle. If you work it too hard, it can become fatigued or injured. Still, we try because we're desperate to change. We grit our teeth and give it our all, and it works at first for a bit until it doesn't because our willpower ran out. We can't, but God can, and God will if we turn to his power. We can't, but God can, and God will if we turn to his power. Um, remember, if our why and our who is Jesus, this lines right up with that. Even the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, wrestled at times with implementing the good things he wanted, to, he wanted to be doing. So Romans 7, verses 21 through 25, he said, For I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells within my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul relied on God's power, not his own willpower, to see him through the struggles. So how do we do that? How do we rely on God's power? How do we rely on God's power? Probably the biggest part of that is to ask him. Ask him for it. For example, God, I don't feel like doing my habits today. Line me back up with why I do them. Please give me strength to continue even though I drop, drop the ball for a little bit. It can be as simple as that. Uh, we can help that process along and prepare for it in a couple ways. Uh, we can renew our minds with God's word renew our minds with God's word, and linger in his presence while things are good. Linger in his presence while things are good. It's kind of like that pre-deciding we talked about earlier. Practicing those things ahead of time will help us rely on God in the moment when it's hard. And don't just rely on him for tasks. Rely on him in relationship. Don't just rely on him for tasks, but rely on him in relationship. A little later in that same passage in Romans, Paul wrote this, Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is, is a term for daddy. Uh, again, our relationship with God should be our core driving force for all of this. And, and since we cannot consistently continue to do the right things over the long haul on our own power, we will fail at times. And we have to be okay with that. Everyone else knows that we'll fail at times. We have to be okay with it too. So in our habits, value progress over perfection. In our habits, 
value progress over perfection. When we falter, ask God for the strength to jump back in and keep moving forward. Like I said earlier, never miss twice. So to make changes that last, focus on who rather than do, train rather than try, step rather than hope, farm rather than fish, and rely rather than will. We will not be here next week. Uh, some of us will be in Kentucky, and it, you can jump in on that if you're like, I'm just going to be at home board. $150 for an awesome trip of service and bonding. Um, SVSU's spring break for those of you who aren't students here. Uh, but two weeks from now, I will be starting a new series going through the armor of God and, and working through that passage in Ephesians 6. Uh, for those of you who are in Heather's life group, going through the armor of God, um, I'm sure there will be some reinforcement and some different angles than what you've been going through. So I encourage you all to stay tuned to that. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll break into discussion groups. God, I thank you. Um, I thank you for, for who you are. God, I thank you that... Um, you, you give us power beyond ourselves, power from your Holy Spirit. We, we don't just have to try harder and, and keep failing, God, but you, when we rely on you, you can enable us to succeed and, and equip us and empower us to succeed. And um, God, as we kind of identify an area we want to stop or an area that we want to start, that your spirit would would do that and, and equip us and God help us apply these principles to start with one habit, uh, either breaking a bad habit or starting a good habit. And then once we've got that established, we can add a new one. And God, I, I pray that uh, this concept years down the road will have changed and, and transformed uh, many lives in here, God. Um, just thank you. Give us the, the strength to apply this, give us the memory retention, and uh, we give this to you in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to break into some dis discussion groups. Uh, as you share, try to share in, paid, in paragraphs, not pages. Um, 